thanks everyone for joining us today for this session, which is part of the new Dawn in Travel event organized by the Transformational Travel Council to celebrate this new beginning, we'll say, of tourism. So, and we are today uh, to talk more about community-based tourism and to shine a strong light on actually this often hidden protagonist of the of tourism industry. So now in this moment when you know it's becoming increasingly clear that we need to recognize the centrality of the community in the process um, if we want to rebuild a sector that can not only protect the planet and the people but also enhance their value and their contribution and that so that their well-being improves. So we're talking at in, in a presenting and working with, uh, with communities as uh, the protagonists of this process. So, well, my name is Elisa Spampinato from Traveller Storyteller, uh, and I'm joined here by three great experienced sustainable tourism professional, uh, particularly pr passionate about uh, CBT in that um, for decades. And I'm really happy to present you here, guys, um, Raj Diwali from Social Tours here in Nepal. Um, and uh, we, um, so he's, he's a specialist in the private sector, practitioner, consultant, advocate, a strategist. Um, we have Richard, Peter Richards uh, from Thailand, um, currently Northern Thailand. Um, so Richard has uh, 20 years of experience um, in responsible tourism and community development. Um, is his core passion is working alongside colleagues from grassroots to global to develop and market inspiring local experience, real local benefit. And um, we have here also Jamie Sweeting uh, from Planetera. Um, Jamie is the president uh, of Planetera, a leading nonprofit working with over 150 communities in, six, in more than 60 countries to turn travel into impact. So, um, Without even further ado, guys, I would like to start some some question and here's like a, this uh, fire, uh, very light and a strong and intense campfire we want to share with all uh, the listeners. And um, we're going to go deeper into some questions. So, Peter, I would like to start with you. So, very simple question that is a, is a tip of the iceberg, I would say. So, how to bring CBT to market? So, this is... <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, okay, I guess the, the first fundamental thing is that we are creating a really, really great experience, okay? So, so we're working together with the community uh, to explore together what community members feel proud and comfortable uh, to share with visitors, and also what tour operators feel excited and confident to offer to their, offer to their guests. But the, the heart of that opportunity has to be a great experience because if it isn't really, really fun and inspiring and, and, and enjoyable, it can be simple, very, very simple. It can be small, but it has to be, yeah, you know, yeah, f f fun and it has to be, of course, as well as safe. So uh, in terms of how, how do we do that, if we're looking at the community side, how do we find out what local people feel proud and comfortable to share with guests? Then our team does something called a community study where we work together usually with youth or with people who are, who are literate in the village and we interview all kinds of people. Uh, we meet elders, artisans, formal and non-formal leaders. We talk to people and we try to find out about local occupations, history, uh, faith, celebrations, festivals, all kinds of things. We bring all of this information to, uh, together and then uh, we basically uh, return it or, or kind of share it back to, to, to the community in a meeting and say, right, these are all the amazing things that we found out together with the, with the, the young people in the village, for example, about the community. Um, and, you know, which of these things would you feel pa perhaps proud and also comfortable uh, to share with visitors? So that, that would be part of the process. And then that creates what we call a long list of possible activities or experiences. We would then take that and we would confer with maybe 20 tour operators uh, who had a, a, a more or less responsible tourism, eco-tourism, cultural tourism profile, and we'd ask them to choose the three or four experiences from the list that they felt had the most potential for their customers. So this is the way that we try to find a balance between what the community are proud and comfortable to offer and what tour operators are excited and confident to offer to their guests. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. It looks like you are orchestrating kind of, uh, in a way, you're putting together a dialogue. Yeah, you are, is uh, this co-design, I think, is the, is the key word in, when we talk about community-based tourism, I suppose everyone agree on that, is that this co-design of 
everything. And I like that you start talking about the feeling. How, what do you make you feel proud, proud and comfortable to share? This is, this is, is bringing the community into this dialogue, yeah, on a, on a peer-to-peer level, I would say. This is actually the, the, the amazing key difference of what community-based tourism is. So I will, I would like to, to carry on um, talking to Raj, then also is um, a TTC ambassador for Nepal and um, one of mm, very influential um, uh, professional uh, in Nepal and Asia about responsible tourism. And uh, he has also um, work with his ethical travel portal that is in inbound Norway. Um, and immersive experience is what you, you know, is your uh, bread and butter. So, um, Tell, tell us more how to work local development with communities in terms of from the private sector perspective and approach, because this is talking about um, different actors working together. So there is a community, there is a private sector, there is there are government and there are other sectors. Um, so tell us a bit more. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, see, the private sector is the money bridge. Right. I mean, just like Peter was saying about the bridge. Right. I mean, we are the money bridge, you know, so we we have a lot of knowledge and we eventually bring the money into into the into the community. Right. Where where it's happening. So uh, the first part of it, and I'll go back to what Peter was saying as well and try and connect that up, is that the experience has to be is critical. Right. And the experience, the, the need for experiences keeps on changing. Right. Right now, after COVID, it's become food suddenly. Yeah. Everybody is looking for the best food. And they're looking for more authentic food and more organic food because they think, you know, if we eat good food, we'll not get the virus, which is all nonsense. But anyways, right, whatever works, right? So what we have, what we have from the private sector is a good knowledge of what might be happening out there on the market side. That's the one thing, right? Now, if you're a local operator that is actually working with communities, you also have a good feel of what could be potentially offered. Right. Better still is to have somebody like Peter doing all the homework. <laughs> but when you don't have that, then you'll have to do it yourself. Right. You have to do it yourself. Try to find out what what would work with the community and then use the two, balance the two on a win win basis. So the community has the benefit of the knowledge. Use that knowledge. Uh, and if you're ethical, make sure that their benefits are also maximum. Right. And not just exploit it to the to the nth amount because in communities you don't have to pay a lot actually if you want to just squeeze them out you can squeeze it very easily but if you want to do it ethically you start you know working with their guides working with local knowledge uh highlighting the local knowledge and that's one side of it right and then of course you bring it out to the market now there's another side of work that we often do as as private sector which becomes very important uh for, uh, for the communities and for community-based tourism is that we educate the market, mm -hmm. right? Educate the market on a regular basis. So each trip that goes through educates the market again, you know, through reviews, through, you know, to also showcasing that it's possible to do certain things. And it's not, eventually it's not just educating the market, it actually educates the government, it educates all sorts of people, right? So it educates the whole environment on what is really possible because at the end of the day, uh, if the experiences are not great and it doesn't make money, community-based tour tourism fails. And we have seen it fail time and time and time again, right? And also the other important part, which is a very difficult thing. Now, you talked about problems as well, so I'd like to bring out some problems uh, while we are doing this, right? Is that when you start off with community-based tourism and then you look at the community, look at the pride, look at the you know, mechanisms and then start putting the market in place, it can also disrupt very fast. Because tourism is like wildfire. We all know that, right? There's a, there's a very famous statement somewhere. And, you know, it, it can burn down the house very fast. And it does. It does so many times, you won't believe it. You know, I know of communities in Nepal where, uh, you know, developmental operators like Peter, and thank God it was not Peter, who came in and, you know, <laughs> done a homestay-based system, which, uh, you know, as soon as it started working well, suddenly the lodges came in because the groundwork was not done to, con to control that. So immediately private sector investment came in, big turned into a lodge, then a resort, then a concrete house. And then that's the end of that experience, right? So, uh, so that's a very difficult one to manage because now if the community owns it, they can do whatever they want with it. Tomorrow, if they want to create a resort out of it, fine, 
right? You have to leave it to them to, to decide. But if you, if you plow in the right information and you have the right partnership, the solution is also to keep on educating the community to try and build that up, right? And not just do it and hand it over and say, here's the market, here's the community, go ahead and do it. And then it all goes all over the place. So the private sector can play a very important role in that. And I always say that it is the, the conscious private sector working, right? Who's thinking about it and not just doing it for the sake of the money, not just doing it because the market exists, but actually thinking deeply about how communities can benefit out of it and also trying to uh, control greed is what I like to say. This is my little pet thing, right? So they control greed a little bit and say, you know what? I'll do my part and that, that, that'll that be really good. And I think that's that's where I think the private sector really comes in. Well, thanks for that, Raj. Uh, sharing that is really, it really brings some important things. Apart from the in initial that you were, it sounds like a scouting as well, right? In a way, um, part of it, like because community has, uh, um, has all these... Um, um, cultural heritage, uh, tangible and intangible, that sometimes they're not even aware they are. And sharing it that tourists they want to want to learn more about what is out there. Culture we know so little about, it, uh, you know, the different culture present in the world. So this idea I've seen a lot as well, this um, uh, tourism in, in, with, for some community has meant um, also rediscovering their own roots and rediscovering their own culture, rediscovering and value it more. The moment they present it to someone because someone is interested, they say, oh, oh, they like, they, they're interested. So this must be important. So yeah, like give more space to this. And this is um, started some very uh, virtual circle, right? That I, uh, of course, there is that the, the bad side. And I like that you, you use many times the word educate because I think this is the moment that, uh, we, I mean, not the most, but we had to carry on and even bring in this mission to, to educate the public because we are more sensitive to different uh, issues, right? Not mm -hmm. only climate change, but also the importance of culture, the importance of the local communities, but that sometimes the tourists will be lost. What that means, how, how do that, what, what's, and so, who can educate, who can bridge this gap is who's on the ground working ethically with the community. So this is really important and uh, extremely I'll important. Quickly add that, you know, having said that, um, a lot of the private sector is super lazy. Yeah? They mm. can't be bothered to do any of that. So, you know, if you present them with something, they'll just exploit it to hell, you know? And that's, that's, a, that's a very, you know, simplistic way to look at it, but it happens a lot. You won't believe how many community-based tourism that have, uh, you know, ideas that have come up, which have been genuinely very good when they started, has been exploited to, uh, to just become a circus, you know, to just become a circus. And uh, it looks like everybody's benefiting, but actually there is more detrimental, you know, there's no net positive coming out of it, right? And, and that, is, that is kind of, uh, uh, there's no education there, if you, yeah. you want to use that word as well, uh, which is very difficult. Um, also, the other thing is, I'll just quickly put one more element into this, into this whole mix. Please. Yeah, is that, um, you know, it's very important to also get to the traveler because the traveler is, is traveling to have fun and to have a great experience. This is very important for the traveler, right? So a lot many times it's very important to think what is in it for the traveler. Hmm. Uh, a lot many times we don't think about that. If you go to a community and do the exercise that Peter is doing, the long list becomes very big because the community says, yeah, I've got a temple out here. It's fantastic. And then I have to say, no, that doesn't mean anything to the traveler. Yeah? It might be fantastic for you, but what is in it for the traveler is the whole thing that we have to look back again as well. So that part of the exercise is an educational understanding exercise as well, which you know, is a big role that the, the private sector can play because they handle a lot of people. Uh, but a lot many times, again, if you're lazy, you don't do it. And I believe that this laziness, which I see a lot uh, around and uh, talking also with community, it comes from uh, not accepting then in a way that it was hard work to work with community because it's a trust building relationship. You need a relationship, but a relationship means time. So what a community based tourism means is a time and commitment and heart. And uh, this laziness come and not accepting to just uh, yeah, not accepting that this is a process and this is a relationship, which is as all the relationship yet to nourish it. So no, it's I think, uh, I think also because uh, you know tourism is very lucrative, 
You mm-hmm. can make money really fast. And uh, so there's a lot of opportunists to get in. Uh, people without passion is what I like to say. You know, and they have, they've moved out right now because of COVID. But, you know, I mean, the diehards stay on and suffer. Well, <laughs> the guys who have opportunities move on, right? And so basically, that's, that's the reason of the laziness. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, if it's working already, why do I bother, right? And that's why a country like Nepal has got three, four destinations and nobody bothers about anybody anywhere else because we've got a big rock on, you know, in one corner of the, of, uh, of, of the country, which is the highest in the world, right? And we don't have to bother about anything else, right? And this is, this is pure laziness, no? When, when you have 150 ethnic groups that you could actually work with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And when you think that, that the tourism, <laughs> if done in a certain way, can also bring uh, um, improve the well-being of those other communities, you say, like, there is some work to do here, and then we had to do it, you know, like, uh, yeah, I, I see the, the picture, I see the picture. Jamie, I would like to uh, start talking with you now. Uh, you have a great experience, a very successful, uh, and in terms of with a lot of community and a kind of, you are kind of can tell some stories about how to scale up community tourism. So you want to share some? Yeah, I mean, this has been a, a fascinating chat here. I mean, I think for us, um, you know, we saw ourselves as a, a, an NGO based in, in Toronto and looking out at the world. Um, and then, you know, about a year ago, the world sort of stood still, right? And uh, I mean, COVID first hit us because we have a, a partner community in, in China uh, that was asked by the, uh, or told by the Chinese government to close down in, 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 uh, in early January last year. Um, but it, it's it's been a humbling experience for us, to be honest, to to realise what we should should have been evident all along that that really we're we're a voice for um, and 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 a coach and a and an ally uh, of these communities that that we work with um, and um, I, I guess what's a little different to the conversation so far has been very focused on on developing new product. Um, we're very very focused right now. You know, we believe there are thousands and thousands of community tourism experiences um, that were running quite successfully prior to COVID that that are now desperately struggling and in need of hope. And so uh, we're reaching out and and providing counsel and 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 training and and just. A, you know, a voice of support right now. Um, but but in terms of to take this to scale, um, I think it really does, uh, yep, we will need more product down the road, but in the immediate, you know, if you're looking at this from a traditional tourism perspective, you, you'd look at it as occupancy. Um, uh, and that's how the hospitality industry measures success is what's your occupancy rate. Um, our occupancy rate in community tourism is is woefully uh, small, even at the best years. So we really do need, uh, we need first and foremost, I couldn't agree with you more, Raj, this is about the traveller. I mean, ultimately, um, for us that, that are on this call, it's all about the communities and having impact in communities. Um, but if you don't provide something that a traveller wants to experience, um, however feel good it is and however you know whatever the development goals that you're trying to achieve I mean ultimately it's going to fail because if it doesn't work for the traveler it won't work for the travel company and then it won't work for the community and I, I can't tell you how many you know times we've seen that happen um, so I think we, we de- definitely need more travelers demanding community tourism experiences uh, either if they're traveling individually and independently um, or if they're working with a travel company, uh, they're, they're demanding that. And, and I think this, this needs to move out of the shadows. It needs to move out of the niche of, of just sort of adventure and eco and responsible and transformational travel operators. Um, I think we need more mainstream operators. And this is a little sacrilegious amongst our community. I, I'm like, you know, why can't somebody go and have a community tourism experience if they're getting off of a, a 2,000, 3,000 person cruise ship? Um, why can't somebody who's staying in an all-inclusive resort get in a little minibus and be taken to go and have an amazing experience with the Rastafari community in Jamaica? Um, these are the ways that, that we both provide a better experience for the traveller to meet local people, 
in a genuine way, not in a servile way where they're serving them, but on an equal footing uh, where they're, they're enjoying a meal or, or uh, music or culture. Um, and, and I think that's really for us uh, vital. Um, I think travel companies need to step up. Um, don't call yourself a responsible travel company if you haven't embraced real community tourism because you're just not. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit outspoken on that. Um, uh, you know, you've got to be able to work with, with communities to, to integrate these kinds of experiences. And yeah, maybe you don't start with the hard work of developing new experiences, go for ones that already exist. Um, and also work with groups like Planetera, who we can be an intermediary. We, we our, our role is, you know, for want of a better term, we're like the old, you know, Irish matchmaker um, of working with the communities, uh, but also working with the travel companies. And, and I think that's how we begin to take this to scale. The other element is government. Uh, we need governments to step up uh, and destination organizations to create the enabling environment, the, the, the legislation, the incentives, the, uh, the promotion of this kind of travel uh, so, so that it does move from being some sort of a nice to have niche to, okay, we're really serious about tourism being a vehicle for in the improvement of our citizens uh, and our voters um, uh, and, and, and really you know, make it something that is, is in, in, in the front of house rather than the back of house. Fantastic, thanks Jamie. Th that's amazing because uh, the whole um, concept of uh, uh, CBT as a, as a niche is like, a, it doesn't, doesn't have a logic behind it because if you think, no, and now it's becoming even more evident, like, uh, if we cannot think of a destination without starting from the community, you know, what the community is experiencing, what is that their basic needs, like in terms of, I'm talking about basic needs, water and, you know, food provision, et cetera. And is it easy? So if the community is at the center and experiencing that lifestyle should be at the center of what tourism is, because tourism is an exploration, right? I'm, I'm not saying there's there no other way of doing tourism, but I'm saying that it's important to detach this idea of niche or um, something special only, uh, only for sun backpackers to do is something that uh, is really is the heart of a tourism in terms of um, getting to know a culture, getting to know a place, you know, who better than a community that lived there for thousands of years knows how to live in, in, in symbiosis with the environment, how to, how to, and all exactly all the tangible, intangible cultural heritage. So is, if you really, so this is something bigger that we start looking, we should start looking in another, from another angle. So it's not like a little- um, Yeah, I mean, so we, we, looked at, we looked at all of the communities that, that we're working with and, you know, we're sort of, you know, rough guesstimates, to be honest, we, we don't have accurate numbers right now, but it's close to a million travelers have been to visit these communities that, that we're working with. Um, uh, you can take some of the best known uh, eco uh, uh, adventure operators in the world and they've never dealt with a million tourists in their 25 year history. Um, this is not niche anymore and it doesn't yeah. need to be. Um, we haven't bridged the gap to get the, the big, you know, travel companies that are dealing with millions of travelers to integrate these kind of experiences into their product offerings. But I think it's a matter of time. And I do think, you know, this is the irony is that the, the COVID has been so, you know, tremendously, you know, debilitating for so many of these communities. But, but I do hope that it, it will give a chance for, for some of these companies to go, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we're actually going to put some effort behind this build back better movement. And here's a tangible way we can do that. And, and, you know, I think the reason we're all so passionate about this stuff is it's just better tourism. I mean, it's more, it's better for the traveler. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm not an elitist in this stuff. I think you can be a hairdresser to, from Des Moines, Iowa, or a, uh, a taxi driver from London and love community tourism. You don't have to be some, you know, boffin PhD to enjoy, you know, anthropologist to enjoy community tourism. Totally, absolutely. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, just to bring mm, the um, these uh, elephant in the room, like the the COVID situation, right? So, <clears throat> and knowing that, uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, there is a, um, a choir of uh, uh, actor that needs to re. Uh, visit the way they look at 
this. So in terms of government, in terms of other, <clears throat> I mean, the private sector, of course, travelers, but uh, looking at all these bigger picture and these different uh, um, actors, like, so um, I would like to hear from, from Peters and Raj as well. What do you see in uh, happening with COVID? And uh, what is that, that uh, the, um, the possibilities, which possibility opens up? What, what you observed, what, what happened? Because we know a lot of communities have been um, impacted heavily because uh, even though tourism it wasn't their main activity, but also was a great source of income. So, yeah, uh, what from that, though, for the, just the lack of uh, uh, tourists, what ha happened in the community with all this moment? What happened in the government to look at the community and would like to work with them? So I'd like to hear some uh, experience from you guys. Yeah, sure. Um... Uh, let, let me start, Peter. <laughs> is that all right? Um, yeah. So in Nepal, uh, you know, I'll just talk about Nepal and give it uh, give real life examples. Then I think it is much more easier to understand because it has just happened recently as well, right? We have a lot of communities up in the mountains, especially who are who are relying on tourism, right? I mean, you know, it's not purely community based tourism. So if you look at it from a definition perspective, but these are communities that rely on tourism. There's no doubt about it, and there are communities who are um, doing tourism as a side business, right? We have that too, right? And both of them react differently to the COVID scenario. For the ones who rely on tourism, obviously the hurt is really, really painful, right? I mean, it, it is like, uh, if you look at the Everest region, you look at the Annapurna region, you know, I mean, it became really, really difficult. And even there, it is different with different people, right? Now, there, there are, there are uh, you know, in the Everest region, because the, the tourism was booming, people were making investments as modernization happened, right? They were adding rooms, they were doing stuff, so now they have bank loans, yeah? And that becomes more difficult. So the bigger, the bigger your operation is, the more you hurt, because now you have a loan also on top of it, right? Then there were communities like, uh, also very popular in Manang, for example, which is a very popular, you know, trekking route, where most of the, most of the lodges were still small, and they were still owned by the locals. And what that could do was that they could close up the community very quickly. And they said, well, I can wait it out. I've got no issues waiting it out, right? So it played to their advantage too, in a, in a situation where there, there was a crisis, they could actually say, you know what? I'll just close it down for a while and not let anybody in and I'll, I'll be fine, right? So from, even from just the COVID scenario and the pandemic scenario, how to deal with it has been different with different communities. Now, on the recovery side, you know, I've been talking to some uh, some uh, some communities that Andaman Discoveries in in uh, Thailand works with, and they're saying that you know because they were only relying on you know side income, it didn't really matter to them, right? They were saying, all right, fine, you know, we'll just uh, uh, we'll just continue on with what we're doing. When tourism returns, fine, it, we'll we'll work with it. And there, you get another opportunity to start working with. Uh, maybe uh, trying to improve the product at this time, you know, playing around with uh, doing stuff and, and, you know, that sort of stuff. And um, now here too, what I found in Nepal is that the private sector could play a very important role. Um, also because in a country like Nepal, and as is true in many other countries, the government, which Jamie is talking about, is not very good generally. Yeah? <laughs> They're not the best people, right? They don't look after, you know, they don't really, really look after the communities as, as much as they, but private sector has got a very important role to play because without the community, like you said, there is no tourism, right? And if you are sitting out there and you have the information to take that information and bridge that gap would be a very good thing for the private sector to do right now, because the private sector currently is the enemy, the tourism private sector, because we bring people who bring COVID who get into the communities. Right. So why don't we also provide the solutions uh, to to actually, you know, help the community? So what we did, what we did, what we tried to do, at least in Nepal, was like we started making infographics. We started making protocols uh, for the communities. And then, you know, I personally went to Kumbu. I went to Helambu and conducted trainings with the lodges. And it became a very nice moment because the earlier relationship that we had with the communities was a pure money based relationship. Right. I send people, I give you money. No, now the relationship is more on a different perspective. Because now we're saying, you know, we're coming in with solutions out here. We're not, we're trying to train you guys and this might bring improvements into the future uh, and stuff like that. So it also presents, the COVID scenario also presents us with a very unique opportunity 
to, to connect with the community at a different level. Yeah, and this might create more lasting relationships into the future because that partnership is kind of important into the future, right? Uh, and now I think there's a different respect, uh, at least with uh, some travel companies who have done the job. <laughs> you know, you'll have a different sort of respect that you'll get, right? From the community because you say, all right, you, I, I know you from another perspective. Yeah, and this, is, uh, this can be quite powerful as well. So yeah. Um, so yeah, different things. I think because also because communities are some some small, some big, some rich, some poor, you know. So all these different scenarios are playing in uh, in, in the tourism scene during COVID times. Thanks, Raj. Just uh, just a note to link and then I'll leave to Peter more time for um, to re to reply. Is, is that idea? Yes, I, I love this. Like this opportunity actually that the private sectors can take to re-establish or reinforce that uh, relationship building that we were talking earlier. And maybe in my naive and idealistic way of thinking, like maybe can also inspire governments when the government is like more blocked in their own way of not looking at the community or don't considering. So maybe, you know, and I've seen this in other, in some cases that government can be actually be inspired by what the private sector is doing why don't think like a, you know, we know the government sometimes a mm, very bureaucratic way of thinking on acting and it doesn't look at things in, from the old angles sometimes. But maybe why not open a, the possibility of maybe can be inspired by the travel, uh, the private sector. So anyway, leaving this um, hope and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, mm, yes, um, thinking about the future. But Peter, what was how was COVID um, for Nepal? Uh, sorry, for Nepal, for Thailand, and uh, for the communities. But mo most of my work in the in the last five years, even though I, I live uh, in Thailand and my family are here, but most of my work has, has been in Myanmar, which obviously, in the last month, like it's 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 absolutely terrible. I mean, we have a, an um, <laughs> yeah, it's awful what, what what's happening with the coup. It was bad enough with uh, with COVID, and now the coup is 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 really. Uh, heart wrenching and it's beyond any conversation about tourism obviously we're talking it goes down to the to the guts of people's people's entire lives um when we only had to worry about covid which was fairly significant in its own right uh, then we were also um trying to help the local communities that we we're working with to develop um, covid safety guidelines uh, we developed guidelines which had actions for the communities for regional tour guides for the tour operators for the for the local you know local government it's just really simple but for every everybody that has to, has to play a part um it's okay like what i find challenging about about this conversation is is the question of when is the right time to encourage or to talk to the community about actually opening you know it, it's one thing to help the community need to develop guidelines for their own safety but we must admit the reality that there's a huge difference in power relations between local communities in somewhere like Nepal or, or Myanmar. And then when Jamie uses the word community in terms of citizens, okay, you know, that's the kind of word that you would usually think about in terms of community in, in, in Canada or in the UK or something, or something like that. And citizen has very strong um, uh, r related meanings in terms of, of rights and, 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 and respect, you know. I think we we use the word community in you know in the developing world, even though it's the same word, it has different connotations to when it's used in 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 in, in Canada or the U.S. or a country with a strong strong democracy and and and, and you know relatively strong human rights. This this this, this I, I I find worrying. You know, um, we're talking about there, there are, for example, tour operators who are saying we need to get tourism up and running again as quickly as possible so that benefits can flow to the community as quickly as possible, okay? The bottom line is, as Raj said, that in many situations, actually, in kind of ironically, local communities have found themselves relatively protected from COVID because they have a mixed economy. They still have one foot in agriculture, okay? They're not relying on one on one occupation. Uh, and so they're, but on the other side, they're, they're vulnerable. They're, they're often in remote places, pretty isolated, you know? So in some respects, the brunt of COVID isn't in this particular situation re resting on the back of the communities. It's more resting on very small SMEs, small guest houses, restaurants, uh, people who absolutely rely on on income from tourism and don't have many savings. You know, and so it, it does. It does. It does. This situation does concern me. If we were using the word community in in you know in in uh, richer countries, basically, then it wouldn't concern me as much. But th th this word, it has. 
Yeah, you know, and I think this also goes back to uh, Raj's original point about um, tour operators and government and everybody else w working as as colleagues with communities. Yeah, I mean, we, we really have to try to take some of the baggage of the word community away and see ourselves as pe all as people mutually respecting one another and, and working as colleagues. Yeah, so... Um, if that's an answer to you, there you go. <laughs> I love that. I love that idea of, uh, yeah, let's see each other as a colleague. Let's consider what community, you know, community, let us say, uh, I like to bring them that um, sometimes that um, pyramids of Marlowe in because the needs, so there were the needs that was used in another context. But if you think that we had to consider some basic needs and the one we talk with community and we want to, we imagine to create a kind of tourism in, offer in a community well we should there are, there, sh, there are some questions i would like to you know an, uh, answer first in terms so of their I own just, basically uh, needs can i just weigh in there because I, I think what we're leading into is is what you know i think is pivotal in in our discussion and of course there's different definitions of communities um I do want to remind you that the 60 countries we work in, uh, uh, the vast majority of them are the developing world, um, but, but there are very marginalized communities within the developed world, uh, migrants or homeless people or differently abled people or indigenous people or people of color. Um, and I, I think to me, so much of what community tourism is is about is about agency. It's about trying to work with communities on a level footing, in fact, not a level footing, a, a footing that for perhaps the first time in their lives, they're able to control their own destiny and that they're the ones that are making the decisions about what they want to do and what they don't want to do. You can provide them with uh, with, with, with the training and the capacity building and the knowledge and the know-how. But, but ultimately, you know, I'm sorry, but who the hell am I as some middle-aged white guy in some rich country to tell them whether or not they should have tourism coming back or not? That's not my decision. That's, that's the amazing woman uh, uh, from the Maasai in, in, in Tanzania. It's, it's the differently abled person in Bali that, that you know, for the first time, their meal service provided them uh, a pride of being able to help themselves and, and not rely on handouts and charity. Um, I, I just think that, you know, this word agency for me is so paramount of, of, of what is, you know, become increasingly evident through, uh, through, through COVID. I mean, our initial response to COVID was to, to run a uh, an emergency response campaign and to, to give out um, uh, grants, food and medicine and, and, and as you say, Eliza, the, the, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But we rapidly heard back from our communities and we did give out 30 grants, um, uh, but we rapidly heard back from those communities. They're like, that's, that's not the relationship we have with you guys. We don't want charity. We, we want a hand up, not a handout. Um, um, and so a lot of what we've been working with them is, yes, COVID training and, and you know, what we, we, we coined the term community of fire. How do you take all of this knowledge that's been put together, but it's not developed for people that have a second grade education or, or, um, uh, or it's not in their language. Um, they don't have internet access. I mean, frankly, it shouldn't be the, the four of us having this conversation. It should be the people that are the ones that are actually running and developing and building amazing experiences around the world to bring travelers into. But they're not in these conversations because they don't have internet. Um, and, and there's this digital divide. Um, so I think for me, you know, for, for the viewers and listeners, those of you that are travelers and are listening to this, you have something you can do here and now in COVID. You can talk to the travel companies that you, you know, whether it's a travel agency or your favorite travel company that you go on small group adventures with, or, or frankly, your hotel company, you know, uh, that, you, that you've got the, the health honors or whatever it is, reach out to them and say, hey, you know, we want you to build back better, build community tourism into your product. And, and you may think, oh, well, who am I? Well, I, I mean, I used to work for Royal Caribbean um, and we had over 4 million travelers a year. 
if you got two or three emails um, about the same subject going into the CEO, the CEO gives me a phone call and goes, hey, what's this all about? So you can make a difference. You really can just by, you know, advocating for this stuff. And, and, and I think, you know, it's very easy to sit in our armchairs and in our offices and get frustrated that what can we do? We're all in lockdown and COVID, but you can make a difference as an individual right now by advocating for this kind of travel. Yeah, totally, totally. Jamie, thank you very much for that. But, and also, yeah, I would like you to invite um, the travelers to hear from them. I mean, I've, I've organizing as a, a CBT ambassador um, but before then uh, a lighthouse, a monthly lighthouse to hear from the protagonists, hear what their stories are, because we don't hear that enough. So we, we've been hearing stories from, from indigenous community in Panama. We are um, we working from uh, Quilombolas in, in Brazil. They're coming every month. I, and then next month, we're going to have some from uh, indigenous from uh, Ecuador that we're going to talk about their CBTs and because they don't have a space, because this is what actually is we've seen. And I my personal frustration in see that there are no seen why I always call in, in, in hidden because they're happening they are small but then it's true technology doesn't help because there are a big gap to be filled but if the demand increases as Jamie was saying if we open up more spaces the private sector but also the media to tell more their stories I think that this is uh, it will will um, um, become make visible what actually already exists and give us opportunity to build other things from with them because when I say well when I was talking about the needs is not thinking about creating a project on there but the thing is um, we are um, is just to go in against that idea of the communities as a, as, um, as a little um, um, bubble where we go and visit and we, uh, but then actually they have their own needs. They have their own need that they are suffering from climate change in a way that we not even imagine. You know, I'm talking with the um, indigenous um, community in Peru and that uh, the impact of the climate change on their life in the last five years, especially is so dramatic they are so in we can't see because our relation with nature is not that symbiotic they they see disappearing um uh plants and uh, you know their father know it that now it is, doesn't exist anymore i mean there are things we don't know this thing why we don't know that they ask this question because there are these stories are not visible we know hear them i mean each one of us can i mean the tourist has a greatest we have as a tourist, the, the tra traveler at this power of, we want real um, experience. We want to visit and meet them, meet my host. My, and then how I do that, and Jamie is, you, of course, you, you made this point very clearly. The power is in the, in the, in, in the, in the traveler and uh, from the um, community perspective is uh, maintaining that identity and uh, sitting on the same table and only sitting on the same table with other actors in the tourism to build together and co-design something that to start from their perspective because otherwise we we are in trouble and <laughs> anyway see yeah, so I, what, I think i just wanted to respond on you know you mentioned climate change and i think yeah. that, you know many of us uh, you know recognize that you know you know, I think it was Bill Gates a couple of weeks ago, the, the founder of Microsoft said that, you know, that, that, that COVID is, is, is easy compared to climate change. And I, I don't love that, you know, terminology, but I think many of mm -hmm. us are, are deeply concerned about climate change. And, and, and I, I want to advocate for community tourism being part of the solution uh, of climate change. Um, I, I'm going to take a, a, an initiative we developed just up the road uh, from where Peter is right now in, in, uh, with the hill tribes in, in, uh, in, in Thailand. And, 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 and what we tried to do was redefine what a hill tribe trek should be in Thailand. For many, many years, uh, people went to Thailand and it was, you know, check off the bucket list. I'm going on a hill tribe trek. But uh, the, the amount of money that was being left in those communities was pitiful. I mean, you're talking you know, less than $5 a traveler for a three or four day trip was staying in those, you know, those communities. And so we flipped it all around. So it was completely uh, owned, run and led by the community. So 100% of the money was staying within those communities. 
um, and then worked on the supply chain of where the food was coming from and things like that to, to have even you know deeper you know multiplier effect of those tourism dollars. Um, but but uh, in the same way that Raj said about those that that you know were less reliant on tourism. You know, these are communities that are agrarian communities. They also have a fish farm, for example. Um, but that's really what, to me, the Transformational Travel Council is all about and regenerative tourism. And, and this idea, you know, this community four years ago, there was a, uh, there was a real um, drought um, in, in, in a, an extensive dry season in, in northern Thailand. Uh, followed by a, a long burn season where they burn the land to, 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 to get the immediate uh, benefit of the, the burn for the fertilizer effect. Um, but then there were massive rains and floods and, and they lost 80, 90 percent of, uh, uh, of their crops. And these communities came to us and said, you know what, Jamie, if it wasn't for the community tourism that we've developed for you, we'd be going to the king with the begging bowl, which in, in, in Thailand is basically saying that they'd need social services because otherwise they wouldn't be able to feed their kids. And, and I do think that we can develop tourism experiences with these communities that, that, that helps me protect them from, you know, these different ons and offs, right? I mean, you know, and, and I think that we shouldn't become over-reliant on tourism but we shouldn't become under reliance on it either. I do think that it can be part of a, a multifaceted diversification of, of income streams for these vulnerable communities. Sorry, Peter, I know you had something you wanted to say. That's interesting, Jamie, thanks a lot. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, I, well, the point I was going to just kind of go back to was when you were talking about agency, actually, because I, I think, I think this, is, this is really, really important. And when we're talking about agency and we're talking about tourists, then we have the issue of the expectations that tourists bring to the experience and how those expectations can be a burden both to community members who are expected to conform to some kind of, you know, uh, ideal or, or stereotype and, and also a burden to the tourists themselves because they can be disappointed by things which only exist in their own imagination, basically, which is which is a shame, you know. So as, as uh, Jamie was kind of calling out to people who are who are travellers, which I think is, a, is very, very valid. Um, yeah, it, you know, what I would say is, yes, you are going to have great experiences like all of us. I, I'm sure it's absolutely true. One of the reasons that we love this work so much is because it's so incredibly interesting and it's so, so rich in, in experience. But if we bring too much of our expectations into that experience, actually, we can accidentally poison the experience, you know. So uh, li life for, for us and for people in, in the community is, 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 is messy and, 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 you know, there's all kinds of things busy, lots of things going on. And so what, what I would say is, yes, you know, like go, go for these great experiences, as Jamie was saying, uh, try to mainstream opportunities for travelers from all kinds of different tour operators to be able to go out uh, into, into the countryside and to meet the people. But the travelers try, try, to, try to control your, 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 your expectations. Don't bring too much, too much expectation because that expectation can actually spoil your experience rather than improve it. You know, lots of communities right now are, are at a crossroads between traditional life and modern life. Yeah, uh, there are things about traditional life which they value and want to maintain, and there are things about more, kind of more industrialized, if you like, life which they which they aspire towards. And even in communities, there are people who uh, are more conservative and, and more and more um, you know revolutionary or, or you know whatever. So yeah. We, we, we need to, in so far as we're going for a community experience, we need to be aware of the connotations that the word community brings to our own expectations, you know. That, that was kind of the point I was try, trying to make earlier. We all work in community tourism and we love community tourism and we understand what we mean by community. But in Thailand, yeah, the, and even in Thai language among Thai people who are maybe uh, people who are, who are poorer people and, or, or are more, you know, mi middle class or richer, this word is an othering word, okay? It's an othering word. It's like, if you say community, people, people immediately think other. We're not community, we live in the town, we mm. live in the city. We're talking about rural people. There's a whole you know, bag full of baggage which comes with that. And the result of it is that people do not really listen to each other. They don't work as colleagues. They don't take each other's opinions seriously enough. You know, so it's a really weird thing, but we're working in community tourism. We're working with communities, but we have to beware of, of of that word as well, you know, and that, that's why I like the word colleagues because we, the four of us now are, are talking to each other from different countries, right? But there's no sense of a power difference between us, you know, or, or one person's opinion being 
more or less valuable, but in, in, in the community, in the society, it really is. As soon as you say community, there, there, are, there are connotations to that. I think, no, I think there's a reason for that too, Peter. I think you've got some really valid points out there. And I think, you know, I'll connect it up with, the, with what Jamie is saying about uh, markets as well, right? The demand is, is kind of important, obviously, because tourism is demand driven, mm -hmm. right? If you don't create demand, nothing is going to happen. That's true. But how the demand is created is very important. I think we, the, one of the bigger problems that we have is that we get into these definition issues, right? And, and we get into these definition wars where we want to say, all right, this is community-based tourism and this is what community-based tourism is all about. And this is responsible tourism, this is ecotourism, and this is adventure tourism and all of that sort of stuff, right? Instead of that, if we started working out from, again, going back to my point of knowing what the traveler really wants, what is, what is in it for the traveler? It's actually the experience. Right, it's only the experience. They don't care if it's community based or you know adventure or whatever. They have the experience that they want. So if you can actually create the experience and highlight the experience that they really want, and uh, and understand that, and then bring that out, you've actually created demand for experiences and not for these little niches that everybody talks about, right? So and when you do that, you've started transforming the whole thing around the the whole. And, and I think that's 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 the big role out here. You know, we take the easy path of just putting a definition, you know, put it on a menu on your on your website and people just drop down responsible travel and whatever is there is probably, you know, so if we can move that around, I think we can create the demand for it and the demand and the beauty right now, I think, especially with COVID, is that people want to know more about people. They, you know, they want to know more about how people are affected. They want to know, understand how people recovered. They want to understand what they are eating, why they are surviving, why they didn't get, in, you know, COVID, or why did they got COVID and recovered? Yeah, all these things. So it's all about people, and this is the moment to create these experiences, right? We're, it's falling right in our lap. You know, it just needs to be done, right? It's falling hey, right in our lap right now. You've, um, you've reminded me of an incredible experience uh, I had in New Zealand uh, run by a Maori community um, and they created a, a model village which usually to me and those of us on, on this call is sort of like bells and whistles of oh dear no. <laughs> they created this model village, you had a they, they had a, a traditional meal, you slept a night in the longhouse um, and they, they, they did a show but they were very, very clear that this is performance art. You're going to be going on a cultural adventure of what your stereotypical view of Maori living is. And then when you woke up the next day, they were like, okay, now we're gonna go and see how Maoris really live. And they take off their traditional garb, they put on their jeans and their t-shirts, you head out in the bus and you go down to the communities where they live and you go to a local community center and, it was the, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life. And uh, while I was going through it, I was very conflicted going, you know, I've been doing this stuff for 25 years and this is just wrong. And then I just walked out going, this was just so right because it was, talk about agency. This was how they were so sophisticated that they were like, we're going to give the consumer exactly what they think they want. Um, and exactly what they, because they want a stereotype of what our community is as a Maori chieftain. You're going to get to meet a Maori chieftain and eat a traditional Maori, you know, festival dinner. And and it, and it, it was extraordinary. Um, and, and I think, you know, to me, that was them having, injecting their cultural humour into the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that. <clears throat> I, I, I find that sorry, Lisa. I find that I find that really, really fascinating. Like that, that for me is 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 is, is precisely where it's at. And and the second day is also authentic in many respects. It's more authentic because it's more sincere. You know, people often say to me, you know, Peter, you work in yeah, community tourism and so on. It's all about authentic experiences. What is authentic? And for me, honestly, 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 authentic is sincere. Like it can be so bogus, but if it's sincere, it's it's it, it, it's authentic. And and we tourists understand that being produced a certain kind of uh, typical or stereotypical experience is, is inherently more authentic. But yeah, as you say, often it isn't, right? So then Raj, you know, isn't part of our job to, and it's, just, it's so difficult, but isn't part of our job to challenge the tourists to, to, to moderate their expectations and, 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 how, and, and how do we do that, you know? Can I, can I just share one, one story? Because I think this is really interesting. Like when, when we worked in Myanmar, we were working with the 
with the Kayan, the, the long, the so-called long neck Karen people. Okay. Now, as we know, uh, the way that the, the long neck uh, Karen or the Kayan people have, have been treated when they were refugees fleeing from conflict in Myanmar and over in Thailand is, is like a worst case uh, scenario of cultural tourism. You know, people talk about the human zoos and, and all this kind of thing. But that that discussion, uh, that social discussion about about the Kayan and about kind of a, a human zoo situation is so well uh, known a, a, among among tourists that they they now you know a lot of tourists have a kind of um, preconception that any any commercial interaction with uh, with the long neck Karen or Kayan people is is automatically inauthentic and also perhaps even immoral or not ethical, right? So then we're working in in Kaya State in Myanmar, which is the homeland of of, of the Kayan people. And uh, some of the Kayan people have actually had the, actually had the chance previously to, 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 the, to the coup. I mean, this is, you know, but yeah, when things were looking more positive in, in Myanmar, people were moving their families back from maybe 20 years, literally uh, in, in a refugee situation. And they were moving them back to, to Kaya State. And in Kaya State, a lot of these people no longer had land, okay? Or they had just a tiny bit of land because 20 years has gone by. And then when we were talking to the people about what they wanted to do, a lot of these, these long neck uh, Karen Kayan people wanted to have small stores, okay? Because that is the experience that they've been able to develop in the last 20 years. And they felt that they'd been exploited by business people over in Thailand. And now they were gonna be empowered to have their own small stores. So we're talking about people with, with a dream and vision and entrepreneurial zest, okay? But of course, the, this happens so many times, guys. When the tourists arrive, they, they want to see the bucolic original state of the long neck Karen. They're coming to the homeland, you know? And so just the sight of a small shop uh, disappointed them, essentially, right? And so then the tourist is disappointed, okay? And, and you know, and, and, the, and, the, and the long neck Karen people, most of the time, don't, didn't, don't even know, to be honest, that the tourist is disappointed because it's, you know, there's such a sort of long story in the tourist mind that they, 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 they're, they're not even aware of it. But this, this I find so interesting, you know, uh, one thing I think is interesting about COVID is that we can no longer pretend that communities are in the past, you know, it's just like it was 50 years ago, it's just like it was a thousand years ago, no, if you go to the villages now, the villages are wearing masks and they're, and they're disinfecting their hands with alcohol, right, here we are together in doing different things, but you know, in 2021, this I find fascinating, is that an opportunity for us to, to kind of dig a little bit of this idea of authenticity and make it more authentic, to make authenticity more authentic, yeah? I love that. So, I mean, guys, I know that he, um, this conversation can go on forever. I, I feel it and it's very inspiring. And I, I, I would like to kind of wrap it up and in a way um, kind of a to be continued in other places maybe and uh, also inviting you to the lighthouses uh, monthly. But also I will think that maybe that this could be an opportunity to re-look at these experiences that when human encounters. So we are cultures changes so the community in our minds uh, in our expectation as a travelers are not that that are in reality anymore so culture and changes move the community changes we have to be ready with no expectation to meet other humans in their own house that i think is what the essence of community-based tourism is uh, i don't want to use labels but here we're talking about community leading um project let they in charge of their own uh offer meaning that uh, they have to feel free to um express what they are and they are and we tourists we have to be kind of ready to you know wipe up our mind from any expectation and be ready to meet other human they had other need and other 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 dreams entrepreneurial dreams as well why not so is you we have to come down to a human level and maybe reconsider what travel really means is a, an encounter right between humans no between so culture is involved but we have to is a kind of a lot of responsibility from, from the disparate different actors involved in, in tourism so but as long as we aware i think we are a step forward in terms of we start thinking about and look at these things as a Oh yeah, that can happen. Oh, okay. So maybe that can start a dialogue to really uh, transform uh, this this uh, this this industry. So I would like to thank you guys for taking part of this um, amazing conversation. Uh, I was really thrilled by having you here and then sharing your experiences um, with a uh, with the public, with uh, with the travelers, with uh, with all the listeners. And um, yes, I would like to. I don't know if you have a last final words. Uh, 
just uh, as a as a farewell or I'll see you later uh, for for everyone. But um, I want to thank you deeply. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sort of desperate to get out there and, and experience community tourism again. And um, uh, I think, you know, what, what we need a little bit, all of us, is is a bit of hope. Um, and, and I'm hopeful that, that as the world begins to open up, um, that, that travellers can can send a message to these communities that, that, that they, they care, that they, this is important to them. Uh, maybe they're coming later this year. Maybe it's not till next year. But 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 send a message that that this is what you want, and 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 that alone will mean a lot to these communities. Fantastic. I must say I just enjoyed it a lot, and uh, like Jamie, I'm stuck here, and I would love to get out. Uh, thankfully, I have had the opportunity to work with communities over over COVID times, and uh, I've learned so much. I mean, usually I lead treks as well. And when I do it, I don't because I'm taking care of travelers all the time. And now going into communities and, uh, you know, going into their deepest fears and also discussing solutions and learning more, this has been so enlightening. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, looking forward to actually discovering my own country even more. Yeah, so getting into into more of these, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, discussions and, uh, developing new products and stuff like that. This has been really, really good. And I and I completely agree with Jamie. I mean, if you're a traveler um, and looking for experiences, this is where you come. And I think, uh, again, with Elisa saying, you know, connection with people, that is it, right? I mean, that's that's what happens at the end of the day. And if you have that respect uh, at, the, at the ground level, then, uh, you know, you're looking at two human beings interacting. And that's, that's the amazing thing that uh, is going to happen soon. Uh, it'll take a little while, that's all. Exactly, exactly. Uh, it's lo lovely to have a chat. Really, really interesting. Lo really nice and to, to listen to all of you and all of your experiences. And yeah, I, I agree. It's all about people, isn't it? And, and if as tour operators, we can somehow facilitate uh, human beings from different places to meet in the most kind of sincere and, and, and real way possible, that's, that's just phenomenal. I really believe we're doing something for the, for the, for the planet if we can do it, you know? Fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and that's great. And that's it, guys. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll see you around, hopefully traveling soon. But here we are. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Lisa. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.